if we withhold our feelings of awe and deep reverence for only the wide eyes and graduation stations and all stages and only the father daughter dances at weddings and only the healthy baby screeching in the delivery room, then that's only going to add up to like 10 days in our life. We're only alive for 30,000 days. I want to make the other 29,990 days full of awe as well. And my way of doing it is by writing down these small and simple pleasures. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today we welcome Neil Pasricha to the show. Neil is an author, entrepreneur, podcaster, and public speaker characterized by his advocacy of positivity and simple pleasures. He is best known for his The Book of Awesome series and The Happiness Equation, which are international bestsellers. His first TED Talk, The Three A's of Awesome, is ranked one of the 10 most inspiring of all time on the TED site. Neil hosts an Apple Best Of award-winning podcast called Three Books, and his most recent book is called Our Book of Awesome. In this episode, I talked to Neil about how to live an awesome life. The levels of depression and anxiety are at its highest today. Now more than ever is when we need hope and positivity. According to Neil, the key to living a happier life is appreciating the little things. All and gratitude should not be reserved for big moments, but they should be cultivated in the everyday. We also touch on the topics of social media, motivation, confidence, and authenticity. I really enjoyed this chat with Neil. He's a really good guy and he really has this real positive energy and he just inspires you just by talking to him. So I'm sure he'll inspire you all as well. So let's just get right into it. Here we go. Neil Pasricha. Well, it's nice to finally meet you after all the, it feels like years we've been talking on Twitter. I know. Nice to meet you too. Yes. Twitter. Well, that's a whole other topic. Twitter. Oh, that's become, but I wouldn't call Twitter awesome right now. Would you? No, I, I'm actually... I'm actually very close. I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm a 2023 full social media delete. Yeah. Delete yep. guy. Sounds I'm like right. thinking across all platforms. Yeah. I'm finding it hugely interfering with my mental health, but also my ability to, to do deep work. Yeah, so I'm, point. I don't know what else there is to do. And I think like you, you know, I've been working for a lot of years to try to cultivate an audience with a podcast and email list. And those things don't need, you know, algorithmic interference. So I'm hoping that it won't be as big, but I'm hoping it's enough to kind of preserve my mental health and kind of keep me off the scrolls. It's not just Twitter. I find Instagram, Facebook, they do the same kind of thing. I just don't feel good when I'm done with them. That's important to know that about yourself and to to create that boundary around your life. I don't need to tell you that. (laughs) You write about this stuff. You've been really wildly successful with your Book of Awesome series. But can you tell us, uh, tell our audience a little bit, just step back, tell us about who you are. You know, what are you all about in life? You know, what uh, what are you all about, man? Yeah, sure. I My mom was born in Nairobi, Kenya, and my dad was born mm-hmm. in Amritsar, India. They had an arranged marriage in England. Uh, mm-hmm. The arranged marriage was their second date. The first date was my dad asking my mom if she would eat a hamburger. She said yes proving that she wasn't a vegetarian, and that was good enough for the wedding, which followed two weeks later. They emigrated to Canada in the late 1960s. I was born in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, just an hour east of Toronto in 1979. And like, who am I all about? What am I all about? You know, I think I had a pretty comfortable childhood, Scott. Like, you know, my dad would say to me, you know, never forget how lucky you are. You got power in your house. You got water in your taps. You got schools across the street. You got hospitals down the road. But Growing up here with all these advantages that we experience being, you know, you're in New York, I'm in Toronto, that we experience, they're pretty invisible to you when you have them. And so I didn't, I didn't appreciate those base kind of things I had going for me until my late twenties. In my late twenties, I went through a really tough period of my life. I lost my, my marriage and I lost my house because we were living together. And I lost my best friend to a suicide all within the span of a few days. And for a lot of people who maybe have experienced more hardships than me, you know, this would be a bump in the road. But for me, Scott, it was like I was destitute. Like I was I stopped eating. I stopped sleeping. I lost 40 pounds and I wasn't I wasn't that big. I lost 40 pounds. I would love to lose 40 pounds. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what everybody (laughs) was saying to me in the hallway. They were like, you look great. What's your secret, right? But it was just stress. I started therapy uh, for the first time in my life, and it became clear that I was one of the people that needed to go to therapy multiple times a week (laughs) to to start processing this stuff. And it was in this period of my life 
And by the way, what was I doing at the time? I was working at Walmart. I was director of leadership development inside the world's largest company. And multiple people have that title. But my job was trying to figure out how to grow leadership inside the world's biggest company, 2.5 million employees. So that's my day job. But outside of work, as I was going through this tough time, I started a blog called 1000awesomethings.com just as a way to try to cheer myself up. Perhaps inside me, Scott, I had some inner optimist from my dad, just like knowing that writing down a positive thing every night before bed would be good for me. But it wasn't like it came easy. A thousand sounded like a small number at first, but my first post sucked. It was it was broccoli flower, the strange mutant hybrid child of nature's ugliest vegetables, like green cauliflower. That's all that's all I could come up with. I write this post, I push, you know, posts on, on WordPress. And for the next 1000 straight weekdays, I just keep doing it. I just keep doing it. It was it was like a vine out of the out of the quicksand for me. And over time, these little posts started to hit a nerve. I wrote old, dangerous playground equipment one month into this blog. And it hit the front page of a website you might know called FARC.com. It sent 50,000 readers to my site in one day. And suddenly, I never went below like 5,000 people again, like reading the daily awesome thing. Wow. And so whether it was, you know, wearing warm underwear from just out of the dryer, or getting called up to the dinner buffet first at a wedding, these what I call awesome things, you know, started finding an audience. A fortuitous career, it, it began now 14 years ago, the path that I'm still on, which is, you know, being one of these people like you, like many of our mutual friends, simply trying to figure out what it means to live a great life and writing about my own experiences and cataloging what I'm learning as I go about trying to do that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. And your first book came a New York Times bestseller, right? Book, the Book of Awesome? Yeah, yeah, the book of awesome. So the book of awesome, I always joke with people, you don't need to buy it. It's just literally my blog printed out and stapled together. Gotcha. I gotcha. mean, when it came out, they printed 6,000 copies. It was a 6,000 copy book, which for those that aren't in publishing, that's not very big, but a few lucky bumps happened. Heather Reisman, who is the CEO of the largest book chain in Canada, she made it one of her Heather's picks, kind of like an Oprah's pick up in Canada. Mm -hmm. That prompted it to hit number two on the best hour list. And then wow. from there, I got invited on the Today Show and then the early show. And those things, as you know, have their own kind of momentum. And eventually, after all the press died down, the book kept selling. And it stayed on the best hour list for eight years and sold over a million copies. And so that book uh, hit the New York Times a year after it came out, actually. So it wasn't an instant, you know, that, you know, the phrase instant New York Times bestseller. I have never identified with that. Yeah. Phrase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So that's interesting. Like, how's your life different from not being a bestseller to being a bestseller? How does that change you as a person? I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it just, it, here's what it did for me. I, I'm, as I just mentioned, my parents are East Indian immigrants to Canada. And so the life path for me, Scott, was supposed to be like, you know, get good grades in chemistry and biology and physics and math and go to med school, go to med school, be a doctor. You know, in, in Indian culture, it is the it's the kind of the highest guaranteed kind of income. Mm -hmm. And it's the like in the in the arranged marriage culture. And, in, in, you know, it's like, are they a doctor? What kind? GP? Specialist? What kind of specialist? You know, and and so I failed on that path. I, I did business school instead twice, uh, once up in Canada, once down down at Harvard. Uh, in the states, and so for me, I um, I had already fallen off that path. But quitting my job at Walmart that would have been a whole other thing. That would have been saying goodbye to like a pension, a nine to five job, uh, uh benefits. Uh, you know, who's going to pay for the dentist if I don't have a job? And so it took me eight more years. Eight more years. We're on the side. I wrote five books, gave two hundred talks. Thank goodness my company, Walmart, was so kind to like keep letting me take like a day off here, a day off there, a day off here. I, I said to my speaking agency, I can only do speeches on weekends. It was just weekends because I kept the day job. And at Walmart, it was hard to say goodbye to it because I was given really cool jobs. I mentioned the director of leadership development role, which was my last role there, which was a great role. But I also got to be project manager to our CEO uh, for four years, a really cool development experience where... um I sat outside the CEO's office and I helped him, you know, with everything he was working on. And so I had these cool development roles at Walmart and I was writing books on the side for eight, for eight years until 2016 mm -hmm. when the happiness equation came out, which is, it's just one of my bigger books. And at that point, I just said, I can't do both any lot for any, anymore. I quit 
I was really scared. I was really nervous. I thought this huge lurch into like, you know, the abyss of having no benefits and no reason to get up in the morning was going to be like a free fall. And looking back, I honestly wish I'd made the leap earlier because there was so much more I could do once I was spending all my time on it as opposed to just evenings and weekends. Yeah. So that's like the career answer. And then the personal answer is that I also have gotten remarried now. And we have little kids who I hope you don't hear through this one, <laughs> through this conversation, mm-hmm. but it's, there's a chance. And so I'm still living in Toronto. My wife, Leslie and I are, um, you know, uh, we've been married, uh, a number of years now and we have four little boys under eight years old. So we've got a, a busy house at the same time. What does she do? What's her profession? Leslie is uh, a TDSB, Toronto District School Board, inner city elementary school teacher. I wow, often God liken her, her to like a, wow. I liken her to like Michelle Pfeiffer in Dangerous Minds. Yeah. You know, nice. she's, she's yeah. a real like rock star in terms of working in, inside inner city schools and helping kids, especially around age 12, 13, grade seven and eight is kind of her specialty. In addition to that, she's also a trained parenting coach. I get to brag about her a little bit. Trained under Dr. Laura Markham, who you might know. Um, who wrote a yeah. wonderful book called Peaceful Parent, Happy Child. Yeah. And yeah. she also conducts empathy-based circles in our community for parents and for kids. So she's doing a lot of kind of social and educational work in our community. And I'm very lucky to be married to her because she helps me every single day with a lot of the stuff I'm stressed and anxious and worried about, which is always a lot of things. That's wonderful. And your mission seems to be about the awesomeness of every day, like every day off awesomeness. Yeah. Um, uh, awesomeness as a word can sometimes connote something profoundly, this great peak experience, you know, where you're standing at the top of the mountain, you have, you're in that moment and you're like, wow, this is awesome. But can, you can find awesome in the everyday is a, it seems to be a big message of yours. And there's also a positivity to what you're doing. Why do you think uh, people need this? Do you think they need it right now, even more than ever? Yeah, absolutely. Well, a few things. First of all, if you go on Urban Dictionary, the definition of awesome is uh, the I'm word Americans to use to describe everything. Yeah. And as you're intimating, you know, the kind of classic definition is one of kind of like a mixture of reverence and kind of staggering beauty, like looking into the abyss of the Grand Canyon, sta- staring out into the Milky Way. But you're right. I actually tried to use that word and repurpose that word back into focusing on life's simplest pleasures, because I don't think that all those awe-inducing moments we have in our life, Scott, whether that's the healthy baby screeching in the delivery room, the father-daughter dance at the wedding, the, you know, the, the wide eyes in a graduation stage, they don't add up to much time. They don't really add up to that many days of the 30,000 days we have. And so when I was going through my divorce, when I was going through the loss of my friend, I found that focusing on these tiny, simple pleasures was good for me. And Hell yeah, I think people need it now. There's higher than ever anxiety, higher than ever depression, higher than ever loneliness. We've got suicide rates that are pretty off the charts compared to where they've been over the last few decades. And so why in this era of infinite abundance do we seem to be living with the greatest mental health challenges of all time? I'm convinced that part of the reason why is because we aren't as good at seeing all the tiny little pleasures that surround us every day what I had in my house growing up was my father constantly reminding me of these things. You know, he'd, he'd point out, you know, the, the look of cream dissolving into coffee. He'd point out the little stickers on the bananas and say, can you believe this came all the way from Ecuador? And he'd constantly be doing that. When I first showed him an iPhone, he was like, it's like the whole world in your pocket. You know, yeah, he was true. constantly filled with this idea of awe. And I think that these things have bad marketing plans, man. Like, like who, who's, who's, who's on the marketing committee for all the tiny joys in our life? They, there's no, there's no, uh, sponsored posts on Instagram that's going to tell you that wearing warm underwear from out of the dryer is good for you, but it might give you a smile and a piece of joy in the middle of a busy day. And that's why I think we should all try to practice and cultivate our ability to see those things and share those things and talk about those things. And I have been given the gift of being able to do that in a number of books. You're right. They all have awesome in the title for the most part. The book of awesome, book of even more awesome, book of holiday awesome. It's kind of a one trick thing. At the same time, <laughs> it's, it's because I need it. I need it. I'm naturally bent towards seeing problems, seeing negativity. We all are, right? You know, you know this better than anybody. Not all of us. Some people are 
predisposed towards optimism. What I mean is that like the amygdala secreting fight or flight hormones, like, you know, the, the idea that inside us when, when there's a, when there's a wreck on the other side of the highway, we all rubberneck, mm. you know, when there's a blood test back from your doctor, pretty much everybody scans for that high cholesterol, you know, you get a math test back from your teacher, you look for the one you got wrong. Majority of us are, we've had three millions of years of evolution on these brains, like look, scanning for problems, finding problems, and identifying problems. It's it's the design of almost everything in the world. I always say to people, shouldn't we pay doctors when we're healthy as opposed to when we're sick? Like every single thing in the world is oriented towards looking for problems, finding problems, and solving problems. I know what you mean. You're saying some people are naturally predisposed to be positive, and I hear you. It's just that I think that those people are few and far between the natural bent of most of us to be rubberneckers, cholesterol lookers, and, and you know, errors on the math test looker seekers. Like, we, we look for those mistakes for the most part. Yeah, as a species, we evolved for that to be beneficial, to make our tongue go toward the um the the toothache as opposed to uh the rest of the teeth yeah yeah that's, that's yeah true. tongue toward the toothache i like <laughs> it and and like it's kind of worked out right like we'd be remiss not to mention that this orientation of our brain has kind of worked out pretty good for our species we took over the whole place you know we figured out how to make tools and boats and get everywhere and kill almost everything and kind of we took over we won we this is we ran, we run the place now. I'm just saying in the world we live in today, those are not as helpful to us now. And if you're listening to this and you're somewhere warm and you have clothes on your back and perhaps you're surrounded by devices or screens that can fill you with any form of information that you might desire at, at, at a finger's push of a button, there is less need for your brain to see uh, a non-responsive email or a negative tweet or a bad review as the way you're interpreting it, which is, you know, the end of everything, right? Y you don't need to see it that way. And yet we all do that. I'm, I'm on the precipice of a book launch, man. And I, you know, three days out, I, I should not be worried about, there's no reason I should be worried about my book launch. There's no. absolutely no reason. There's no reason from a success point of view, financial right. point of view, uh, results, but yet I can't sleep at night. Because I'm worried about it. Like, why, why is that? I know I shouldn't, but I, I can't not. It's what are you like worried I, about? Yeah. Um, what do you fear? Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because when you probe down a couple levels, you're like, well, what is it? Like, I think that's, that's what, what I was saying to Oliver Berkman, who I, who I know you're connected with as well, is I think the thing I'm really playing for is the, the right to keep going. <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, I, I really just want, this is my 10th book or journal since 2010. It's 2022 that we're speaking. And I've written 10 books or journals in 12 years. Like, by any measure, you know, you're done. You don't need to keep going. And <laughs> at the same time, I can't turn off that inner engine inside me that's made me want to do all those things. And so what do I fear? I probably fear irrelevance. I probably fear... um I'm afraid talking to you because I know how smart you are. I know who you have on the show. And I'm like, I'm going to be asked things that I just don't know the answer to. I think I'm afraid of, of, um, <laughs> you know, maybe not being proud of my own work. When you have immigrant parents and when you bring home a math test and there's one question wrong and the first thing they do out of a place of love is sit down with you at the kitchen table and work on that one you got wrong. Mm. You know, perhaps my brain is just going to do that my whole life is constantly try to win. And unfortunately, when I first wrote the book of awesome in 2010, the, the metrics for success were like this, like bestseller list. And it, it was printed once a week in the newspaper, right? Now that number is on Amazon and it's refreshed every hour and it doesn't turn off. And so this is kind of the equivalent for authors of like the infinite scroll. Our brains are programmed to look for stopping mechanisms. You used to read the newspaper till it was over. You used to watch the news till it ended. Now we're so deeply immersed in these never ending scrolls and these never ending screens and these never ending extrinsic metrics that if you can't turn it off yourself or you don't have a way inside your life to put your phone in the basement, put it on airplane mode, go up to bed an hour before, like if you don't have this stuff designed, you're going to fall prey to the endless algorithms that are going to just suck you back in. And I think at the root of it is, you know, it's 
capitalism. Like, I mean, the, the point of the machine to keep scrolling is that it can feed you more ads and have more of your attention and make more money off you. So that's partly why, not as overtly in our book of awesome, my new book, but I have in my last two books before this really talked a lot about systems and habits and the design of life to create and ensconce our minds in a place where we can feel contentment, satisfaction, freedom, and these like pleasures that seem really far off sometimes. But if we can design our life in a way that enables them, then you know what? That's pretty good. And it's harder to do now than ever before. The trauma, loss, and uncertainty of our world have led many of us to ask life's biggest questions, such as who are we? What is our highest purpose? And how do we not only live through, but thrive in the wake of tragedy, division, and challenges to our fundamental way of living? To help us all address these questions, process what this unique time in human history has meant for us personally and collectively, and emerge whole, I've collaborated with my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jordan Feingold, MD, to bring you our forthcoming book. It's called Choose Growth, a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. It's a workbook designed to guide you on a journey of committing to growth and the pursuit of self-actualization every day. It's chock full of research from humanistic psychology, positive psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, cognitive science, and neuropsychology. So lots of themes that you hear about on this podcast. And it's aimed to help us all integrate the many facets of ourselves and co-create our new normal with a renewed sense of strength, vitality, and hope. Whether you're healing from loss, adapting to the new normal, or simply looking ahead to life's next chapter, Choose Growth will help steer you there to deeper connection to your values, your life vision, and ultimately your most authentic self. Choose Growth will officially hit the shelves September 13th, and you can order your copy or the audiobook in the U.S. now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and all major retailers. If you're in the U.K. and Commonwealth, you can order now at bookshop.org.uk. We truly hope this book helps you grow and thrive and become your best self. Okay, now back to the show. How come, like, with with all your successes, like, you're still insecure? Like, uh, how's that possible? You know, on one hand, it's like, maybe I'm successful because of the insecurities. You know, it could kind of go the other way around. But I wrote this two by two in um, The Happiness Equation that has always been resonant to me. And it is a, a confidence matrix. And I think on one axis, let's call it the x-axis across the bottom, you got your opinion of yourself. It can be low or it can be high, right? If it's left, it's low. If it's right, it's high. And on the y-axis, it's your opinion of others. It can also be low and it can also be high. Scott, I think if your opinion of others is high and your opinion of yourself is low, you are insecure. So the top left box is insecure, right? I mean, yeah. I am, I live there sometimes, right? Now, if your opinion of yourself is high, but your opinion of others is low, then you're arrogant. And I live there sometimes too. Mm -hmm. If your opinion of both is low, that's the bottom left box in the matrix, then you're cynical. And I live, I live there sometimes too. Now, mm -hmm. my definition of confidence is when you can hold in your mind at the same time a high opinion of yourself and a high opinion of others. And that is confidence. Okay, that's how I define confidence personally. I will say in 2010, when the Book of Boston came out, I was confident probably 5% of the time. Today, you know, moving through life, uh, moving through relationships, you know, achieving some of these goals, but also just like getting older and, and you know, being more comfortable in my own skin, that 5% is probably moved up. It's probably somewhere between 30 and 40% of the time I'm feeling confident. And for a lot of people, that sounds low, but hey, man, that's like a, that's a lot of growth for me. <laughs> you know, I've, I've come a long way. And so, yeah, I still feel I insecure sure and cynical and arrogant sometimes. But my journey towards confidence is something I think of more like a North Star. It's like inch by inch, day by day, situation by situation. Well, you're always trying to grow. I mean, for a lot of people, the pinnacle of the mountain is getting that New York Times bestselling book. And you could kind of just stop there. <laughs> The problem I think with that thinking though, and I, I, sometimes I ask people, I've asked a couple of close friends of mine, you know, what's your, how you, what's your definition of success? And they're like, when I get invited on your podcast, that's how I'm going to know I, I've made it, right? Really? Oh, well, maybe I should feel like I've made it then. <laughs> yeah. You're very, and you are, you are going to be on three books in 2023. We've already talked about this and played date bingo about, <laughs> for about three yeah, months. True. I know. I think Oprah came calling and then suddenly I was like, you know, second fiddle for a little bit. 
<laughs> Just kidding. Um, but here's what, I say, here's what I say to them. I say, don't put your success on me. There's a difference yeah. between intrinsic motivators and extrinsic motivators. And you know this research as well as anybody. You know, there's that famous study, um, Teresa Amabile, uh, yeah. originally at Brandeis University, now at Harvard yeah. Business School, where she had, you know, girls teach the piano to other girls. And one group was given the joy of teaching piano. And the gift of being told thank you, right? Mm -hmm. Intrinsic motivators, largely. And the other group was given, like, two tickets to the movies after 30 minutes of teaching. Mm -hmm. And it's not a surprise that the extrinsically motivated girls were less patient, they spent less time, and they had poorer results. There are poor results. And many studies have replicated this, that extrinsic motivators, unfortunately, they replace intrinsic motivators in our brains. We can't see the joy of connecting through someone's travel log photos on Instagram when all we're presented with are the number of likes, the number of comments, the number of followers, the number of these numerical adjudicators are extrinsic motivators that cover up the intrinsic reasons that we got the thing in the first place. I mean, I remember when social media was like about seeing your friends' pictures, you know? Now, on my own Facebook group where I have a 100,000 people follow me, I can write a personal note. It only goes to a 1,000 people. I have to pay to reach my own audience, and then I'm encouraged to do that because I see how, what's the reach? What do I optimize? How many comments? It's like the whole thing is being game to be extrinsically motivated and you end up losing yourself on the process. So mm. intrinsic over extrinsic always. And another way of saying this is simply do it for you. Do it for you. Make sure that the thing you want to be doing is something for you. There's a reason that David Foster Wallace, um, author of Infinite Jest, wrote a really famous essay that I love called The Nature of the Fun. And he talks about how after you've achieved some measure of commercial success, you're incentivized heavily to chase that success. That's why the second uh, Strokes album sounds like the first, right? And I don't mean to use that band as an example, but for the most part, if you hit some measure of success, you copy that kind of music or you copy that kind of writing or you copy that kind of stuff until you realize that the reason you got successful in the first place was because you actually were chasing fun. The nature of the fun's thesis, therefore, is that what you need to do, even after you've had commercial success, is not change those, chase that extrinsic motivator, but rather try to get back into the intrinsic feeling of joy that you had when you were producing that thing that was successful in the first place. And no surprise, that sometimes leads to more success because now you're chasing fun again and that comes through in the work. So true. What is the happiness equation? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Everyone wants to know that. Everybody I, wants I want to know, know that. that. I want to Everybody know that. Everybody wants to know that. Everybody wants to know that. The subtitle of the book, The Happiness Equation, is want nothing plus do anything equals have everything. What I did in the design of that book, and it wasn't programmed, like I didn't write it this way on purpose, but I ended up coming up with nine, what I called at the time, secrets. You could call them chapters. You could call them totems. You could call them principles. Nine things that kind of went three by three under those tent poles. So want nothing had three pieces underneath it, which were be happy first, where I talk about um, how it's not great work, big success, be happy. It's the opposite. Being happy actually leads to great work, which leads to the big success. I know you've had Sonia Lebomirsky on this, on this, on this, on this wonderful show. So, you know, yeah. she's the, her, uh, Jane King at Dean are like, this is the formative work on, ha on, on positive psychology. Uh, chapter number two was called Do It For You. It's where I talk about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations. I talk about the three kinds of success, which we might want to go into. Three types of success, I'm sales, down. social, and self. Have you heard me talk about this before? No, no. Okay. okay I can it. talk about this for a second. Basically, I believe that in everything you do in life, you have to choose the type of success you want from the beginning. And there are three kinds. There's sales success. That's obvious. How many is sold? Uh, how big does it get? Right. Social success. That is less obvious, but it's the, it's the, it's the recognition from your peer group, right? And then there's self success, which is, do you feel proud of your accomplishment? And I say, I argue that it's impossible to have all three and you have to pick which one you want at the beginning. And I often use movies as the best metaphor here because traditionally the hurt locker won best picture when it had $26 million at the box office. Whereas Alvin and Chipmunks the Squeakwell had $400 million, a much bigger sales success, but was nominated for no, no awards at all. No, no social success at all amongst the movie going audience. And it's like that every single year at the movies, the year that Moonlight, you know, 
won Best Picture, had $19 million at the box office, and Fast and Furious 7, like, almost made a billion dollars. So it's like, which, which would you rather have? And the reason I think that's important to delineate between the two is because I'm often asked as a writer, hey, how do I write a book? And then when I probe people on what they're trying to write for, it's often not sales. My, I wrote the book of awesome. I was really going for sales. I was really, I was in bookstores every day. I was signing books. I was saying yes to any radio station that wanted to have me on. I was trying my best to have the book sell, right? But when I ask people, well, what books do you want to write? They're like, I want to catalog my grandmother's memoirs for our family. Okay. I really want to document, you know, like this cool approach I have for building backyard decks. Okay. These aren't going to sell. Well, I don't care. I just want to do it. Well, that's a different, per- <laughs> that's a different reason. So discriminating between which actual type of success you want for me, Scott, as someone who's kind of, you know, wound up a little bit is it helps <laughs> me remember what the purpose is from the beginning. So when I started my podcast, three books in 2018, I purposely said, this is not for sale. I'm not going to put any ads on the show. I'm not going to have any commercials. I'm not going to have any sponsors. I'm not going to orient myself that way. I'm going to do this for myself, a personal self-learning journey where I get to ask people which three books most shape their life. And then I buy and I read the books in advance. And I got your books upstairs, by the way. I got your Maslow on my my shelf. So yeah. And so I buy the books, I read the book, or at least flip through it. And then that is what I'm playing for. And whenever I get Whenever I get, you know, weepy and say, oh man, how come my podcast isn't in the top 100 wedged between Tim Ferriss and Rich Roll and S- Scott Mary Kaufman? I just remember, well, that wasn't what I was doing this for in the first place, man. It Not was, it was, yeah. I, I was, I, I told myself it was for mm. self success. Okay. So the second secret in the happiness equation is do it for you. And the third one is remember the lottery, where it's just where I paint out the portrait that my dad always taught me about realizing how lucky we are to be here right now. Mm-hmm. And those three chapters are under that first principle, want nothing. And that's where I come up with the title of the book, The Happiness Equation. It's not because I've figured out happiness. It's because I tried my best to write down everything I knew at that time, which was 2016. And I put it in the form of a letter to my unborn child. So when my wife was pregnant, that gave me the creative orientation towards writing the book, which was in the form of a letter to my son on how to live a happy life. Wait, so one nothing is is just one part of the equation. Do you want to go through the rest of it? Do anything is the second, which is about freedom. And so my first Autonomy. principle... Yeah, well, my first principle actually is uh, maybe counterintuitive. It's, it's the most controversial chapter of my entire book. It's called Never Retire. Wow. Yeah, and so I believe that the concept of retirement is just this complete false idol in our society today. Mm. Retirement was invented in the 1800s, late 1800s, in Germany by Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, which is the coolest head of state name ever. And at the time in Germany, youth unemployment was like between 20 and 30 percent. And the um, average lifespan was 67. Guys, keep, keep that number in mind, 67. Otto declared that anybody age 65 who wants to kind of retire, invented invented concept, um, could do so. It was optional. That's another thing. So it was optional, not mandatory, which it is in many countries mandatory. And it has been in Canada for a number of years and they, they took off the mandatory aspect of it. But in a lot of countries is like, Hey, you hit 65. You're out. You know, it's over. But notice that it was only two years. <laughs> it was only two years from the average lifespan, which was 67. Penicillin wasn't invented for 40 years. Right. And so we've mimicked that number. Uh, you know, the UK followed 65, the US followed 65, Canada followed 65. A lot of countries around the world follow this number and lifespans have dramatically increased. And so now what we have in our society is this false prophet that you hit this age. And in fact, if anything, we want to be younger where you get to kind of like, you know, throw in the time stamp, you know, punch, your, you know, make your last punch at the meatpacking plant. And you never need to work another day in your life. A whole community, I write about this in the book in a little bit more detail, but you know, this entire industry emerged of like retirement living and the design of the whole ad campaign was like, you deserve it. Like, you know, this is, this is your reward for like a great, great long life of work. And if you look at tables and graphs throughout the 20th century, the percentage of people who chose to retire was like 9% at the beginning. And then, you know, in the 80s, 90s, it started becoming like 72%, 85% to the point where now today, it's like a pretty common concept. But I think that there's a problem with the idea that you want to do nothing, that you, I don't mean want nothing in terms of contentment, which I was describing in the front of the book, but I mean like that you desire to like be accomplishing nothing to that you can afford it, 
right? That's the other thing. It's like, it's just, it's just, it's just massively underwater, just financially, and that we can afford to pay others to do so. These three things kind of fall away. Instead, I argue that we don't actually want to retire. We just want to do something we love. And I think that work can be broken down into four S's. Um, number one, social connection. Okay. That's really what we want. We want to be, we want to be socially connected to people. Number two, stimulation. We always want to be learning something new. Number three is structure. You want to have a reason to get a bed in the morning. Yeah. You know, everyone's week has the same number of hours in it, right? 56 hours for, for sleep, 56 hours for work and 56 hours to do what you want. Those things add up to 168. Everybody gets 168 hours a week. I think that the structure is important to have a reason to get a bed in the morning. And number four is story. You want to be part of something bigger than yourself. You want to be part of a community, a group, or a tribe, or a place that is accomplishing something that you could not do on your own. And so what I argue in the book is that we actually don't want to retire. We just want the four S's. And if we're constantly seeking those S's in our work, then that will actually lead to a happier existence. So that's yeah. chapter number four of the book. Chapter number five is called Overvalue You, where I talk about um, the way to measure your time in terms of dollars per hour, no matter what job it is you're doing. And I talk about how that's actually a scale, how um, when I graduated from Harvard Business School in 2007, the majority of my peers work in like 60 to 80 hour weeks in jobs like consulting and banking and private equity and, you know, those types of things. And they weren't that happy. And so I compare that job with other jobs, um, like an elementary school teacher, maybe not surprising to you that my dad's one and I was, I've been married to two. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, I seem to surround myself with teachers. The only ones that could, that don't wither at my endless questions, I guess. I compared to an assistant manager at Walmart, which is where I was working at the time. And I show that all three jobs, the highfalutin kind of 120 grand straight out of business school, Harvard business school job, the 45 grand, uh, teacher's job, which has, as, as you know, more time off throughout the year. And the sort of 75K at the time, these were the numbers I was using, um, assistant manager job at Walmart, all of which, all three of which jobs I had good access to in terms of numbers. I distilled all three jobs down to be making the same exact $28 per hour. And so that was kind of the principle of this, the fifth chapter. The sixth chapter is called Create Space. And I'm really proud of myself, I gotta say, for like having my whole book memorized here right now. Um, Create Space, which is, all my models and tools to actually create space in your life, right? They are things like my, and I don't know how many people will be kind of listening to this versus watching this, but I could draw really quick, quick for you what I call my space scribble, which is, um, I argue that every single decision that you make in your life takes a certain amount of time and is of a certain importance. So time and importance. Oh yeah. Time yeah. and importance. It's different than the seven habits of high, highly effective people model where, um, Stephen Covey is, is comparing time and urgency. And mm. the key takeaway from that two by two for those that have read seven habits is that we typically are over focusing on urgent and we're mm. under focusing on important. Okay. So you're that, a systematizer. <laughs> you're a systematizer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, you know, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems as a 2000 year old, like, you know, proverb. And it, it holds true for me today because I argue that the low time, low importance decisions in your life, Scott, need to be automated. There's a reason why I've, wear, I've worn the same, pe I've worn the same sweatshirt and the same sweatpants every single day all week. You're I do cool. change <laughs> the stuff underneath. I do change the stuff underneath. But I automate that, right? I'm in the same room. So, I, I, so same what background. is what is that? Is that is that low? Uh, what what low is time, what low is, importance? Well, yeah. So, for example, it's like I've automated the same thing for breakfast every day, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same shake. It's got the same ingredients. I've had it for 15 years. I, if I ever need to go anywhere, I just, even though I'm in my own car in my own city, I'll automate that to Waze, you know, the traffic app. I like. You know, it's a low time, low importance decision. I just don't want to be thinking about which way I'm going to go. So I just outsource that. Um, it's the same reason Barack Obama says he only wears two colors of suits. The same reason Mark Zuckerberg says he only wears the same color of shirt. It's this, it's the same reason that anybody who, um, you know, my friend Chad, uh, has every single consumable item in his entire house on Amazon order refills, including like towels and soaps. You know, he knows that he needs like one new face towel every six months. So it just like arrives mm -hmm. because he's automated that decision. That's More cool. interestingly, though, in this two by two matrix, though, I think is the um, 
high time decisions that are not very important. This is where we are spending the majority of our time today, Scott. And I think, yeah. So this is like emails. Email is a great example. Does it say regulate? Forever. Does it say regulate? It does. Okay. Okay. It does. And I'm trying to make them all rhyme for you too. So yeah. um, <laughs> nice. the, the high time, low important decision needs to be regulated. And so email is a great example where I regulate email on my good days when I'm doing it right uh, to two hours a day from nine to 10 in the morning and four to 5 PM. What that gives me is two hours in my inbox every day, Scott, which is a lot. That's a lot yeah. of time on email. That's a lot. But you know what it also creates for me at 10 AM to 4 PM email free six hour oasis every single day. And so I think that regulating is really important. When Leslie and I, my wife's name is Leslie, um, bought our first house. It was downtown Toronto, really old house. Man, I'll tell you, every something broke in that house every day. It was like a fuse popped or a patio stone is wobbly or like a cupboard door is squeaky. And then we were driving ourselves mad trying to like fix stuff every day. Eventually, what we ended up doing was we made a, a list on the inside of one of our kitchen cupboards of everything that was breaking in our house. I sent my wife a recurring invite on the first Saturday morning of every month called Old House Day from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., three hours a month. That was it. And what ended up happening was we regulated everything that was falling apart in our house to one kind of binge batch process on the first Saturday of every month where we regulated these annoying things into a specific window. That made 29 days of every month kind of worry-free, right? Now, what about the stuff that's really important that doesn't take very long? I almost had to invent a word for this one, but it's a real word. It's called effectuate. Effectuate just means get her done, execute. You know, what's really important that doesn't take long? Saying hi to your team every morning, saying bye to your team every night, picking your kids up from daycare. Just do it. Just do it. And the cool part about this model, what this affords me, if I follow it and others, if they follow it, is you actually create space, which is the point of that, that, that sixth chapter, um, to debate, to debate the high time, high importance decisions. I see Mm. your work on the psychology podcast as ultimately what you're doing is grappling and wrestling and toying with, you know, these gigantic life themes. Well, this is your debate quadrant. When you're on your podcast, I don't see you checking email right? I don't see you like mm. being mi- distracted by a million things. So well, you're, you're doing a very it. captivating you- guy. Yeah, that's, that's the, those are the kind of key concepts from the happiness equation, which is the, the, the book I wrote on happiness, two books before this one. Yeah, very cool. And I feel like there's still one third left. Yes, there is. There is, which is called ha- have everything. This, this is my have kind of everything. more motivational part of the book. Um, yeah. You know, for example, one of the biggest questions I have been getting since the success of the book of awesome is what do I want to do in my life? So I called chapter seven, the ultimate thesis is be you. And I gave people three ways to try to figure out what they want to do in life. They are called the Saturday morning test, the bench test and the five people test. So I take people through these three tests to try to figure out what you want to do. What's the Saturday morning test, Scott? Well, what do you do? on a Saturday morning when you have nothing to do. Yes. I know what I I, do. What? But we can't talk about it on the psychology podcast. (laughs) 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 And I'm saying trace back from your natural proclivities. I will sleep all day. I will sleep all day. Yeah. Well, so for somebody that's like, I go to the gym, it's like, okay, you know, how do we wildly, you know, uh, you know, brainstorm off of your interest in going to the gym, anything else you might be interested in. Are you interested in being a personal trainer? You want to be a whey powder importer, exporter? Do you want to, do, do you want to be a gym teacher? Like let's wildly brainstorm off of the thing you're naturally interested in. So that's the Saturday morning test. The bench test. Um, I had a friend in high school named Fred who got into every single Ivy League school and he was in Canada where I live. And so he rented a Jeep for a week and he drove to all of them and he performed a test on every single campus, Scott, where he found a bench somewhere in the middle of campus and he sat on the bench patiently for an hour and observed his natural reaction to all the conversations around him that he heard. Nice. And I think that that type of test is missing wholesale from our society. You, we know that before you buy a car, you should test drive it, but no one test drives. We very rarely test drive a house. Yeah. We very rarely test drive a job. You go in for an interview, but how often do you ask for like a walk around the office? How often do you say like, could I just like shadow someone here for a day or two? Like that type of stuff is yeah. so, how many people do you know that went to law school that say like, yeah, I really, I actually hate law. Like I just didn't know once I finished 
that I wouldn't like this job, right? Tremendous amount of our peers in this space are lawyers, right? Susan Cain, Rich Roll, Mel Robbins, mm, they're that's lawyers. Interesting. That's really they're lawyers, interesting. Yeah, right? Jonathan yeah. Fields is a lawyer. So that's kind of the thesis of, of, um, of the kind of the last half of the book, which is kind of like how to embrace your authentic self. And um, the very last chapter of the book, because I was yeah. so afraid of writing a book that was really prescriptive, Scott, the very last chapter is yeah. don't take advice. Yes. I, I basically just, I, from did you know mom. the word cliche <laughs> is actually like a, from a French typography word for like words that are so frequently used together, they can be put together on one like metal stamp. That's what oh, a cliche that. is. I didn't know that. Okay. So I went back through history and came up with every single cliche I could. Huh. And as you could imagine, they all have an exact and direct polar opposite, right? So yeah. it's like actions speak louder than words. Or is it the pen is mightier than the sword, right? Um, is it, you know, uh, the early bird gets the worm? Or is it good things come to those who wait, right? right. And so, so basically what I do is I say, th- one day while I was researching this chapter of the happiness equation, I actually found that the top story on the New York Times, which is like, you know, the number one newspaper in the US was like, you know, scientists say, you know, it was a big quoted study, you know, with lots of, you know, lots of prominent names that, you know, nobody's getting enough vitamin D, right? Mm. That was the, and at the same time, at the same day, at the same exact time, the Toronto Star, which is the top newspaper in Canada, had its number one article saying, nobody needs extra vitamin D. They had a bunch of studies with a bunch of names, with a bunch of people saying, you didn't need, you didn't need vitamin D. And that's my point. It's like almost all advice ultimately conflicts. The real answers have to come from inside you. So I try my best in that book to give people as many of my ideas as I could. And at the end, just reminding them that it's you, not me. Take what works. And remember that the ones that work are partly because they're already resonating with something inside you that you already think or know. What's the relationship between that and having everything? You can have everything if you don't take advice uh, from well, i'm trying to make the i just there. had to make the equation work man i just had to make it work at the <laughs> end of the day you know what <laughs> the original title of the book was called how to be truly rich oh, and I at see. the very last minute the publisher said it was putnam publishing uh part of um penguin group and penguin random House, you know since the merger um and they were like truly rich like that's going to make people think rich like you know money and i was like no no truly rich it's about like you know I true see, life yeah. satisfaction. They're like, no, no, no. We need the word happiness in it. Really, it's about happiness. And so we were just brainstorming how to get this. I don't come out and say ever in the book, nor ever in any interview or speech or anything. I don't say like, I know the secret to happiness. I know the equation to happiness. I don't say that. People often credit me with the sort of um, happiness is reality minus expectations. I often get that. And I don't know why. I don't know if I look like Tim Urban uh, <laughs> or, or what, but really that was him who, who said that great wonderful little equation, which is happiness is, I'll say one more time, reality minus expectations. I think he wrote that in a, in a wait, but why post and it went really viral. But if you look through my history, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation that part of the way I came into this stuff was because I went through the throes of a really terrible time. And in the throes of that terrible time, I, I wrote a TED talk called the three A's of awesome. And if you watch my 2010 TED talk on TED, it is attitude, awareness, and authenticity. So the 2010 version of myself, which is like, that was 31, that was what I would argue was the answer to the big question we're talking about today. The answer is, Scott, attitude, awareness, and authenticity, right? Then the 2016 me, which is the writer, the writer of the happiest equation, would, would have made this argument that, okay, here's all these little totems. It's, you know, be happy first, do it for you, remember the lottery, you know, never retire. And we tried to come up with a structure that held those things together. And now here today in 2022, now I'm 43, I'm married, I've got little kids. You know, I I think I'm a little bit more comfortable with myself. I've told you my confidence has gone up. But at the same time, I've also recognized more and more and more, Scott, that almost nothing I do that's prescriptive takes as well as the stuff I do that's non-prescriptive. And so the first book I wrote is The Book of Awesome. If you open the book, it doesn't sound like a highly systemized thinker talking. It's me talking about flipping to the cold side of the pillow in the middle of the night, right? That's what the book's about. And the feedback I get on that book is 
this is the only self-help book that doesn't tell me what to do, but it shows me how to do it. And so I've partly returned to that concept because through the pandemic over the last few years, I have felt those old demons of anxiety and depressive thoughts and so on like resurface again. And it ain't just me, you know, yeah. National Institute of Mental Health says 43% of us have a depressive symptom today. That's, that's a depressing symptom right there. You know, that's like almost half of us. So, you know, Gene Twenge saying, you know, one in three college students have clinical anxiety. You, you right. were doing an event with Jonathan Haidt at, uh, at the Comedy Cellar. Like he is, he is, he is harping on these same numbers as well. Vivek he Murthy, sure the Surgeon General saying loneliness is at an all time high. The CDC says that our suicide rates are now 18 per 100,000, which just wow. to contrast with murder rates, that's triple. That's triple our murder yeah. rates. Wow. And so I always say like, we're three times more dangerous to ourselves as <sighs> anybody else is to us. So in this era, what I've done is return to the idea of simply putting out a book that's literally just a pile of awesome things. There's nothing else in this. I don't have any research in it. Yeah. To our li our listeners who don't have access to the video, you're holding up a book of your, your I just want to state this in audio format. It's called Our Book of Awesome, a celebration of the small joys that bring us together. And what I thought was so cool about it is you really kind of outsourced this and you got a lot of uh, diverse uh, walks of life kind of giving you their own sort of thoughts of things are awesome things from wheelchair accessible nature trails i love yeah. that i love that to cooking yeah. for a loved one who's just been released from 27 years of incarceration to a steaming bald head after a satisfying winter <laughs> run or when you go out for lunch and your daughter is your server these are little joys in life yeah that uh really um give you uh a, in a lot of ways even a deeper sense of uh aliveness and meaning than and maybe a lot of the other things that people focus on in our society. Can you be my publicist? Like you just nailed. That's exactly, that's exactly yeah. what I would say. I would say, like I mentioned earlier, that if we withhold our feelings of awe and deep reverence for only the wide eyes and graduation stations and all stages and only the father daughter dances at weddings and only the healthy baby screeching in the delivery room then that's only going to add up to like 10 days in our life. We're only alive for 30,000 days. I want to make the other 29,990 days full of awe as well. And my way of doing it is by writing down these small and simple pleasures, adding a gift note to yourself on your online order. When you find out what was making that horrible smell and getting rid of it, opening the dishwasher <laughs> and somebody already emptied it, you know, yeah, sleep, sleeping in sheets that were dried in the sun. Rejigging the entire 3D puzzle of your freezer to somehow squeeze this giant box of chicken fingers in there. Peeling the dry glue off your fingers, right? And so yeah. I think simply by focusing on them, and you mentioned, yeah, it's cultivated from a lot of people. Well, what happened was at the back of the Book of Awesome, I actually put a page at the back saying, you know, if, if anybody wants to write your own, you know, go to 1000awesomethings.com slash submit. And I had that feeding into a Gmail account that I never checked called 1000awesomethingssubmissions at gmail.com. When it came time, Scott, to put this book together, I went and checked the Gmail account. I had received over 10,000 complete essays from people around the world who had taken the time to write down their own awesome things. And part of the magic of the book of awesome is that the book is simply a vehicle. It's simply like a little, it's a little torch and it tells you and helps you spark your in your own imagination what's awesome to you. So I can't tell you the number of times someone's been like, we set up a wall of awesome in our in the in the lobby of our residence. Oh, nice. Or we ended up making a book of awesome in our fifth grade in our fifth grade social studies class. Or you know, at the old folks home that I work at, we decided to put up a little like, you know, everybody writes one thing down and put it on the wall. People stop and they read them and they smile. And I'm not the originator of this concept. This is the least original blog idea of all time, right? A thousand awesome things. This guy's going through a divorce. He just writes down a thing to make him happy. I mean, can you get any more, you know, cliche than that? But I think the magic that came with it, honestly, in the first place was consistency because I posted one a day for a thousand days. When you do anything that long, you just kind of A, get better at it and B, the people that come to you for the same thing, like the same, you have a system and a schedule for releasing this podcast, right? So that you, your fans and your listeners will tell you if you miss one. So I had right. the same kind of, you know, that, that, um, the, the positive pressure of, of wanting to kind of service yes. an audience kind of built up in there. 
And the other thing that was built in there was, I wrote a thousand. Well, the books only have a couple hundred of them, right? So, yeah. so it's the old wedding photographer analogy of take more pictures. You ever ask a wedding photographer how they get so many good pictures? Well, oh my gosh, look at these 50 pictures from the wedding. They're awesome. And they say, yeah, man, I was clicking the whole time. I took a thousand pictures. Of course, I'm going to have 50 good ones. I threw 95% of them away. There's a reason why the guy who has the most strikeouts in baseball, Nolan Ryan, also has the most walks. There's a reason why the guy who has the most wins, Cy Young, also has the most losses. The wins pile up when you pile on the number of times you step up to the plate. My point is, the reason I've been able to do kind of well, I guess, with these books, or the books have been able to do well, is just because if you write something every day, you could pick, you could cherry pick the good ones to put in the thing, right? You're, you're very consistent. Yeah. Well, consistency is, is, man, we underestimate how that can, tr- that can trickle over time. Well, and also it depends what, what you're running from. Like for me, consistency was consistency of writing an awesome thing was probably pulling me away from other things that would have been less healthy for me to do. Right. Whether that's related to nutrition or how I'm spending my time socially or how I, or, or that's related to like, uh, you know, uh, drinking or whatever it is. It's like this was a, a positive pull in my life that helped to kind of balance me and keep me oriented towards things that I knew logically that I wanted to be focusing on. Absolutely. Do you take time to yourself to bask in the glory of your past accomplishments or are you always moving on to the next thing? There's no basking. That's for sure. Um, I'm even Why trying not? to process you. Why not? What you, well, cause like, so that's a part of savoring. It's a part of, I would say a part of awesomeness. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've certainly, I guess, designed my life through these systems and, and, and models to, to be comfortable. And so, you know, um, I bought a very comfortable sweatshirt, you know what I mean? And, yeah. uh, I, I have a Rubik's cube piece of art behind me that a guy made it. out of Rubik's cube I that, 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 yeah. that says, wow. And I got to design what that looks like and it looks really cool. And it wasn't cheap, but I really wanted it. And so, you know, I can do a few things like that. But the reason there's no basking is because, like, what does basking do? Maybe you're, maybe I'm confusing what you mean by basking. You're saying savoring. That is different. Probably. Yeah. I mean, we have this it, in my book, choose growth. We have a four by four matrix. I know you love that shit. I know you love the two four by, by two four. or four by four. I'm uh, sorry. Two by two. Two by it's two. Four by four, man. That's like three dimensional. I jet. meant two <laughs> by two. My bad. I know you love the two by two matrix. And so we have one of savoring and, and, uh, and luxuriating is one form of savoring, but. Um, marveling, like being wonder and all at the world, but, but basking, I mean, you're allowed to take some time to just think to yourself, wow, I had written 10 books. I yeah. have a, a, had a book on the New York Times, multiple books in the New York Times bestseller mm-hmm. list. Like I have really grown a lot in my life and I should be really proud of myself and I'm in, allowed to, just spend a day doing these things you call distractions. I will allowed to just get a massage today for myself. I call it healthy selfishness. You know, mm-hmm. like I think that's part of being awesome. I think too. I practice, I do practice that. I think what Good. happened was a, a few years ago, I started getting a few emails a day with people telling me how much the books had affected them, um, steered them away from suicides, um, helped them, uh, in the relationships, uh, you know, I still get three or four handwritten letters mailed to me um, every week. And I had to, in my mind, separate the receipt of those types of notes and letters from how I think about myself in my day. And so when I'm given that type of feedback, usually what I try to do in as gentle ways as possible is try to help the person recognize and realize that, that that's actually something that's come from them. Uh-huh. And while I might have been kind of beside them for that, the truth is, they were beside me too. I owe the reader. I owe the listener. Who am I to even be doing any of this stuff? Who are, who are any of us? You know? And so I have been given the gift of being able to have a podcast and to be writing these who books. Who are you they, not? Well, I mean, like, who's stuff? anybody, I guess, you know? <laughs> I oscillate, I guess, like everybody does, um, you know, bet- between those emotions, but I, I, I don't, uh, I'm also afraid, I think, also as a parent, you know, with little kids, I'm, um, you know, the worst case scenario for me after some out, some modicum of success with these, with these books and so on is to raise children that don't 
see the value of hard and meaningful deep work. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. I guess I'm always working because I also want to be a role model for working, you know? And uh, yeah. I don't mean working like, you know, grinding. I mean, working like the, the joy of, of producing and of making and creating. I don't want to turn that off. You enjoy the mastery process and, um, and learning and being better. No, I can tell. I know. And also, you, you, you come across as very authentic to me, uh, that you really do believe it when you say, well, we are at a global breaking point and we need to combat it with awesome. You're committed to putting more and more awesome into the world and never stop and never stop doing that. So I would end this interview by encouraging you to never stop doing it. <laughs> the world needs it right now, <laughs> especially Twitter <laughs> needs it right now. <laughs> but, um, Thanks, no. Scott. I, the reason we connected in the first place is because I, I, I detected the exact same vibes from you. Oh, you're authentic. No, you're very, you're very, very authentic. I really, really love your podcast. It's often oh, at a level thanks, of Neil. thinking that's like a, you know, a little over my head, but I try my best to keep over up with you too. and your guests, but yeah, it's, it's just a wonderful gift to the world and, you know, keep it up too for you. Thank you, Neil. It was a real pleasure having you on my show today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.